Good evening. I'm Jose Cardenas. Thank you for joining us. Voters make their choices in this year's state elections and federal midterm elections. We'll have analysis of the results, a look at the winners and losers in the 2014 races in a moment. But first, some reactions from the candidates. And I, and I have made this commitment to the people of our state. I will strive every day to make Arizona a place of opportunity for all. I will do that by pursuing goals that are simple to state. More than ever before, we must encourage economic growth, startup businesses, and good full-time full jobs. Tonight, the message goes out to entrepreneurs and investors across America. If you're looking to build, relocate, or add jobs, then Arizona will be the place for you. And I will tell you, I am committed when I'm your Attorney General, to making sure that we work hard every day to protect those that can't protect themselves. We are going to sweep the state. I can feel it. And you know, when I won the primary, I made all of you a promise. And that promise was that I was going to make you proud. I'm feeling great. We're feeling very optimistic. Um, we, we think we've done very, very well so far. We know that the votes that are out there um, are many, many still to be counted. It's going to be a long night, but I'm very optimistic. Here now to talk about the results are Mario Diaz, president of Mario E. Diaz & Associates, Bettina Nava, partner and consultant with First Strategic Communications and Public Affairs, and Rudy Espino, assistant professor with Arizona State University's School of Politics and Global Studies. Thank you all for joining us on Horizonte. Um, I, I'd like to get each of your uh, surprises uh, on the table first, and, and, and we'll talk about them as, as we go along. But Bettina, for you, what was the biggest surprise? I, uh, there's a couple. One was the margin of victory in the gubernatorial race. I, I expected Ducey to win, but that margin was significant, uh, a little more than what I expected. And then just low turnout with Democrats. I, I thought that there were good candidates, the Democrats had put up good candidates, and yet there was little enthusiasm and turnout. So the two would be connected to a certain degree. Are there other reasons why you think that Ducey had such a great margin of victory? Um, I think that his message of jobs and opportunity was actually trumped education. I mean, I think we can sit here and say that Duval's message of education, they correlate with one another, right? There's a connection. But somehow talking specifically about jobs and bringing jobs to Arizona somehow resonated with Arizona voters more. And Mario, that's exactly what Ducey talked about in his acceptance speech. Uh, Arizona is a place to do business. How much of a factor do you think that was in his victory? Well, uh, the, economy, the economy is number one, especially for those that are high propensity voters. We can talk about, in the Latino community, immigration issues and education, very important. But right now, we have individuals that are flying to New York, for example, to work, those that are in the, in the union trades. There's, there are no jobs here in Arizona, very few in the construction area. And when you have someone like Doug Ducey pounding on jobs and economic development for all, that resonates and it puts, unfortunately, education uh, on the back burner. Rudy, a lot of discussion in the, in the papers and in the media about the, the money that came in from the outside, tremendous amount of money that went into Ducey's campaign. How much of a factor do you think that was? I think it played a huge factor, uh, especially how early he received a lot of that money. It also trickled down to certain um, other offices. Um, for instance, once Andy Tobin, Congressional Dis District 1, secured his primary victory, we saw a lot of that so-called dark money flowing to him. Well, but <clears throat> um, uh, it, it, there was a sense, too, that, that you had um, an opportunity that Duvall could have had, Mario, to define himself in the primary, and that money that Rudy was talking about right after the primary ended, in, in fact, I think the day the, of the primary that just went after Duvall on, on tuition increases, did he, did he make a mistake? And would it have made any difference if he'd done it differently? You know, this is the uh, Monday morning quarterbacking of campaigns, and, and, it's, and it's very difficult to uh, be critical, uh, but we're not here to sugarcoat things. Uh, you know, if I were in Fred Duvall's team, I, I would have used the almost $1 million that, that was used in the primary for whatever reason uh, to really identify myself as a, a Fred as a candidate. And, and, and that, was, uh, that was lacking very seriously in this campaign. Uh, and, and from the general to election day, 
there, there are only X number of weeks, and it just makes it very difficult to get your message out. Fred was campaigning for a year. I think he could have done a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Although the campaign was run very, very nicely, a little more publicity for Fred Duvall at the beginning could have been could have been very helpful. So let me ask you the question I asked Bettina. What was the biggest surprise to you in this year's state elections? Well, the anti-President Obama sentiment trickled down all the way to a prosecutorial office, uh, which to me is how can you liberalize uh, prosecuting someone uh, or the Attorney General's office? But Brnovich's campaign did a very good job about that. It seemed like all the Republican candidates did a very good job of putting Democrats uh, in, in, a, in a corner, and we just didn't fight back. And so Felicia Rodolini, to me, is, was, will be a, f a fabulous candidate. Uh, and Brnovich, wh how he won this election is very surprising to me, and by the margin. And that's what you're referring to when you by say how he won? By the margin. Um, uh, Rudy, your thoughts on the attorney general race? Um, well, I think that, I mean, in some ways, it was hard for uh, Felicia Rodolina. This was a Republican year, much but like- But everybody thought she would win, at least going in, because yeah. she had come so close to she, knocking off Horn. Yeah, no, she is a seasoned campaign veteran. She knows how to run a campaign. She ran an effective campaign, but this was just not a year for Democrats, especially at the statewide level, nationwide level. However, there are some exceptions. We look at certain um, some local offices, certain congressional districts. I've already mentioned CD1. And we're gonna get into to, to the right. federal ones in, in a bit, but um, let me ask you, Bettina, on, on the Attorney General's race, uh, Mario uh, touched on this, tainting the, the candidates with, with Obama, and particularly in, in the case of, of Rodolini and actually all of the Democrats, with one exception, bringing up the immigration issue, saying Obama's in favor of, of uh, uh, looser immigration rules, and that's a reason to vote against, in this case, Felicia Rodolini. How effective do you think that was? I think somewhat effective. I think it didn't help also that there's the whisper campaign, true or not, that the president was just waiting for the midterm elections to be over so that he could unilaterally act with the pen and grant some kind of amnesty. And I think that hurt. Again, whether or not it's true, it's, it remains to Even be seen. Even though that has nothing to do with the race, as it Mario hurt. points out. Yeah, yeah, it hurt. And, and what hurt is just the Obama effect, that people really feel disenfranchised and the fact that Democrats didn't show up this race. I was shocked. Rudy, your surprise result. Well, I already mentioned CD1, uh, Kirkpatrick being able to hold off um, um, the, you know, all the money flowing to support um, his, uh, her opponent in Andy Tobin. Um, Cinema winning by the margin that she did against Wendy Rogers. Uh, you know, we still don't know about the results in uh, CD2, um, Barber versus uh, McNulty, um, a rematch from 2012. Uh, so I think that there are some uh, lessons that the Arizona Democratic Party can take from some of the ground games that those uh, candidates use to um, uh, hold off all that money. You're talking money. about Barbara versus McSally? Yeah, I'm sorry, McSally. And, and, and what about at the state level? Any surprises there for you? Well, I, I think what's interesting is look at the vote total that David Garcia um, garnered uh, in his race for um, public instruction. Um, he garnered more votes than any other Democratic candidate running for statewide office. And I think that says something about just that, that name recognition among Latino voters going out, turning out for a Hispanic candidate. And yet he lost in what I think came as a surprise. Well, he hasn't lost yet. We should be careful. Right. Um, there are many votes to be counted and he hasn't conceded, but, but he's losing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many people were surprised because his opponent really didn't run a campaign. She was there, but she didn't run a campaign. Uh, Mario, uh, uh, Rudy talks about name recognition as a positive factor. Do you think it had any negative impact? Well, it, it could have. Just like uh, uh, Latinos were excited about David Garcia candidate, uh, let's just say the truth. There are certain voters that regardless uh, they are not going to vote for a person with the last name of Garcia, and and that's just a fact. There's, there's, there's no there's no dis, uh, dismissing that, uh, and uh, I don't know how much that uh, played a role in this election, uh, but for an individual who is a Ph.D., a veteran, a professor, a father, someone who showed up to debates, and we had a ghost candidate from the other side, for him not to win. There's a big question mark there. So, Bettina, what about that? I mean, it, not only did he have all those, what many people would consider positives, but his opponent wasn't running negative ads. Nobody mm -hmm. was tying him to Obama in the way that they were tying yeah. the other candidates. So w what could David have done differently that, that might have turned this out differently, yeah. assuming that, that he did lose? 
Well, I mean, that could be a variable. I'm not going to be dismissive of it. I think that's a variable. But I think we also need to give credence to the fact that Davis benefited being down ticket from just Republicans and the Obama brand being so negative. So she just benefited from those people. Once they got down ticket, they figured we've already voted three Republican. We're OK voting for a fourth. And then you look at districts like Congressional District 7, where this midterm election and last midterm election, there were 20,000 less votes by Democrats who happened to mostly be Latino. Why didn't they show up? If those 20,000 had shown up, he would have only been 5,000 short. What happened that they didn't feel invigorated to come out? Well, part of that, I assume, Rudy, is, is that it was an off, it was a midterm. And, and voter turnout is low, though there's some speculation that this could be nationwide the lowest voter turnout since World War II. Yeah. Um, so what's happening? So what we see, um, as expected, midterm years, lower voter turnout. But a key thing to look at is who turned out and who didn't turn out. We saw older, whiter, conservative voters going to the polls, being motivated to vote against Obama and his agenda and Democrats. And who did not show up? younger voters, Hispanic voters. And as you mentioned, um, in some of these congressional districts, Grijalva's district, um, um, uh, Gallego's district, uh, voters there did not show up. And the question is, is if those candidates mobilize Latino voters to the polls, perhaps somebody, some of these uh, statewide races would have shifted in favor for the Democrats. What about the voter turnout? Um, Mario, there, there was some discussion a few weeks ago about a Hispanic boycott. Any evidence that that actually occurred? Uh, nonsense. So I won't even address <clears> that. Here, here's a point that as candidates uh, for office, especially minority candidates, uh, we need to get out of this idea that our community is gonna, going to pull us through because we just can't rely on uh, Latino voters. Uh, it's, there's been historical data there that on uh, midterm elections like, like this one, uh, the, the turnout is low and it was very low here. And like Bettina said, had those and a few years ago voted, this time maybe Garcia wins outright. As candidates, we have to get out of our comfort zone and start going after non-traditional voters. And that means that it takes years to be out there in, in the campaign uh, world, campaigning, meeting different people, getting out of our comfort zone. Because we're not, as Latinos, trying to win statewide, our parents are going to tell our children, you know, you can't win. Because there's, there's no precedent except back in the 1970s with Raul Castro. We gotta change that mentality. How do you do it? Get out of the comfort zone and get out there outside uh, our, 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 our stereotypical boundaries. Bettina, one last statewide race of, of significance and that's Secretary of State. Um, probably the one person with the biggest name recognition of all the candidates and all the races, Terry Goddard. Mm -hmm. He lost. He lost. Why? Uh, uh, you know, I think part of it, she has a great name, Reagan. And again, with nearly a 200,000 voter registration advantage, do see everyone's putting money into the gubernatorial race. She again benefited down ticket from registration, from dollars being spent on other Republican races. She has a fantastic name. And quite frankly, Goddard, you know, I saw some numbers, his negatives were, were high. Um, because people knew him and they didn't like everything about that because there is some history there and not all of it good. And she's a bit of a more of a, a clean slate. So I think that helped her out. Is it your sense that there was baggage with the Goddard name as well as name recognition? You know, I really think what happened here is, is um, that our candidates were excellent candidates, but what was lacking really was a sense of um, um, some fire in the belly. And it just seemed to me that Republicans uh, coming in with, uh, with the anti-Obama vote came in with a certain number already, that they were ahead. And then, like I said before, it just seemed like we were put against the wall. We were consistently trying to be defensive and it took away from our, our vision, our plan, our presentation to the voters. Before we move on to the federal elections, uh, Rudy, um, uh, thoughts about the state legislative uh, races, not necessarily specific races, unless you want to mention any in particular, but, but what the current makeup is going to mean to the new governor in terms of dealing with this legislature? Uh, well, we're entering, a, a, again, a, a unified government for Republicans do see. Um, Republicans hold on to the Senate, hold on to the, the lower chamber as well. Um, but over the next two years, the Republican Party here in Arizona is going to have to own up to the budget deficit that we're facing and going to have to make some tough choices. Um, so come 2016, 
voters are going to have a choice here in Arizona again. Are they going to want to send Republicans back into, um, into power here in Arizona? And with a projected budget deficit, I think that Ducey has a lot that he has to deal with. Uh, what kind of relationship, Bettina, do you think Ducey is going to have with the legislature? You saw even Governor Brewer fighting with some elements of her party. Mm -hmm. The time for celebrating is over and it's time to govern and so this is going to be an interesting time. I think he's going to be very, very hands-on. You know, he's a businessman. He's used to getting in the weeds and, and leading policy within his own companies. Um, so I think we're going to see a very hands-on governor. Um, and I think he's going to be leading the legislative agenda rather than our last governor who it, it was sort of legislatively driven sometimes and there was more give and take that way. I think we're going to see a really powerful ninth floor agenda of like here's the things that I hope to accomplish. Mario, uh, are the Democrats going to have any significant influence in this legislature? Well, we can have an intellectual uh, difference, make an intellectual difference and a policy difference. In the last uh, election, uh, under, uh, under the leadership the Democrats had, it was uh, consistently uh, attacking, 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 and and the ideas were were were, uh, were short. Uh, I would say this time, Democrats to be relevant, we need to uh, make sure that we're putting forth policies and presenting different ideas and options. Because if not, then we are going to become uh, once again irrelevant. Let me ask a, a question about. Um one of the ballot measures, which was the one on, on pensions. Um, for the most part, the Democrats and their allies seem to have gone down to, to resounding defeat in the statewide elections. Um, on this one, though, uh, people view this as a victory for the unions. Uh, they're traditionally Democratic supporters. Well, people can uh, look at uh, who gets the victory as they want. The, the honest part of this is that uh, if this proposition would have passed, approximately a thousand individuals would have probably retired uh, within the next uh, few weeks. And that is a drain on city services and eventually uh, to taxpayers and, and constituents. Uh, and so uh, it, it didn't pass. And I think that the people of the city of Phoenix deserve credit. How much of the credit though really goes to the unions themselves, their, their uh, opposition to it and the all the money they poured in, into the campaign against it. Well, I think the, the key thing you bring up there is the, the, the money factor. Um, there was a lot of money that was flowing. We already talked about this dark money flowing to uh, Doug Ducey, this Republican advantage, but there was also union money coming in to, to back uh, some of the initiatives uh, such, such as this proposition um, from outside, um, outside of Arizona. Bettina, switching to the congressional uh, elections, uh, biggest surprise there? Um. I think that we still don't know. I actually expected uh, a couple of those seats to be picked up by Republicans. And so we're always, because that's what happened nationwide. And we're, we're always- about Kirkpatrick and, Kirk, and Barber? Correct, yeah. And I, I did expect that that would potentially, they would uh, shift to Republicans. So that was a little surprising to me. We didn't follow um, national suit that way. We're always a little counter uh, counterintuitive that way in Arizona. Mario, is, there, is that something that Democrats can breathe a sigh of relief about? We still don't know about uh, the Barbara McSally race. Oh, this is true, but uh, I think uh, for Democrats, Kirsten Sinema, uh, Congresswoman Sinema, is a perfect example of a candidate going outside of her comfort zone, going into a district where getting crossover votes is critical. This is the type of Democrat that uh, if, if others want to win and win statewide, we're going to have to emulate. Rudy, you've touched on the congressional races a, a little bit already, but um, uh, let's take a closer look at the one down south, uh, Barbara and McSally. She's, the figures we had on the screen a moment ago, she's about 2,000 votes right. up. Um, if it does go her way, uh, what does this say about Gabrielle Giffords and her influence? Because she came, campaigned very hard, um, some very emotionally touching issues. Um, uh, some people think maybe went a little too far on, on, on some of the ads. I, I, your, your thoughts on that? Hold well, that. Uh, even if, let, let, let's say in a few, couple months, we may not know the result, but let's say Barbara does not win um, and it goes to McSally, I don't think that discounts uh, Gifford's name. Uh, I, I think that she will continue to be a force there in that district for the D Arizona Democratic Party. Um, but this district is no surprise. That's always been a toss-up district. Cinema is now a toss-up district. Kirkpatrick is a proverbial toss-up district. And I think it uh, says a lot to our independent redistricting commission that they've done a good job. Um, 
uh, this is their second time around creating these competitive districts. The fact that we have three competitive districts in Arizona, I think says a lot about the, the, the good work that the Independent Redistricting uh, Commission has done. But Tina, let's talk a little bit more broadly now. Um, uh, given the, the Republican gains, they, they now have the Senate, they have a bigger margin in, in the House. What can we look forward to? You mean nationally? Nationally. Um, one thing that interests me is for the first time in history we have a, over a hundred women serving congressionally. And that is, I think that's going to be a really interesting phenomenon to watch. And so I'm excited about that because it's never happened before. It's a historic day in, in that sense. And, and do you think that we'll see more compromise? I mean, the suggestion has been that, that they're more willing to talk to each other. We had a few examples of that in the past. I mean, there's 400 bills sitting around. I think that now uh, Republicans are going to be anxious to show that, again, it's governing time. So I think there is going to be movement. But that might just be my optimism. I do. Mario, um, uh, President Obama, uh, soon to be Majority Leader McConnell, they're both saying this, the right things in terms of they, they want to uh, make things happen. That hasn't been their history. Well, what do you expect? Well, there hasn't been any history. You're right. They, have, they haven't even met as far as I've, I've, I've heard. So this is a, this is a new uh, beginning. And uh, if, if, um, if, if Obama wants to leave a legacy for the last two years other than decimating the, the statewide Democrats, because I, I really put, put the, put the uh, uh, blame here on, on the administration, whether rightly or not. Uh, this was an Obama psychological attack on Democrats in Arizona. And uh, so I, I hope the president understands that this was a referendum and it's time now to talk about some compromise and to use that executive uh, pen uh, when he has to. Well, we know he's not going to uh, allow Obamacare to be dismantled. Um, what can he compromise on that would be meaningful? Well, I think the issue of uh, tax, the, the tax issue uh, is important. It's been on the table. Uh, I think the immigration issue, uh, do we put a whole plan or do we piecemeal this? Uh, my point of view at this point, something is better than nothing on the, on the immigration issue. On the immigration issue? On the issue. Keystone Pipeline, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Keystone Pipeline. Uh, Republicans say lots of jobs, good for the country, good for the economy. The president says, I don't have proof. It's enough time now to come together and, and decide what we're going to do with that pipeline. Mario, do you anticipate, though, that the Democrats will take the role that the Republicans had and just filibuster and, and keep things from moving? We have uh, this person called Hillary Clinton who is going to play a big role uh, in, in, in Congress, I think, in trying to uh, finish off the next two years on a, on a high note, or else uh, 1600 Pennsylvania or 1700 Pennsylvania is uh, is, is going to go to the de to uh, to the Republicans. Rudy, on, on the subject of immigration, the president had said before the elections that he was going to take executive action after the elections. Um, uh, the Republicans are all saying uh, right after the election, you do that, and you've ruined really any opportunities for for compromise. Uh, what do you think he's going to do? Um, I, I see that he is probably going to push uh, with some un unilateral decisions. We saw this um, in 2012 in June, uh, issuing a directive to change our deportation policy. So I think he's going to try to force some bureaucratic compliance to try to push uh, certain things that the Hispanic electorate have been demanding back s uh, since 2008. And I think that's just going to muddy the waters uh, between Republicans and Democrats further. Um, we have historic um, records of polarization between Republicans and Democrats. I am not optimistic in that that's not going to change. I, in fact, I, uh, I see that polarization, it's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Well, but could he avoid some of that if he didn't exercise his, his executive action authority? Yes, but at the same time, then he risks alienating that key voter base, uh, this growing demographic group, Latino voters, who have been pushing for uh, since it was candidate Obama back in 2008. President Obama in 2012, and here we are, 2014. Where, where are we at with immigration reform? And uh, Latino voters are frustrated. In fact, I think that the sign that you see that that demographic group not turning out in 2010, low turnout in 2012, staying home again in 2014 is a sign that they are frustrated, not just with Republicans, but with the Democratic Party. So, uh, Bettina, your thoughts on that. Does the president lose more by taking action on immigration reform without the support of the Republicans than he would if he 
try to work out something with him? It's just a double-edged sword. I don't know if there's any right answer here because yes, if he if he acts unilaterally to a certain degree, that appeals to the base that's been waiting for something that expects him to deliver on the promises that he's made. On the other hand, if he acts unilaterally, it shows an abuse to maybe some Rep Republicans that are more moderate that have said, "Listen, you know, here's a guy who talks about bipartisanship, but sure doesn't act it." Mario, 30 seconds. Uh, you touched on this Hillary Clinton in 2016. Does her campaign, assuming she's a candidate, does that wipe out all these Republican gains? Uh, I'm sorry, ask me the question again. If Hillary Clinton's on the ticket as presidential candidate in 2016, does that wipe out a lot of the Republican gains we saw this year? Well, she, look, she has an appeal. She has, uh, she's the candidate that has a fire in the belly. Uh, the economy may be better in, in two years. So it could uh, change. It could change. We're out of time, but I'm yeah. sure we're going to be talking about that later. And that is our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte and 8. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.